long-time collaborator Andrew Tooby, probably about two years ago now, asked me if I'd help one of his students finish a solo violin piece. I had, of course, absolutely no idea that that would be the result and still less of an idea that I would meet, sadly, only ever via screens, um, this truly extraordinary man who, from what I've learnt since and from talking to those who did know him, um, for me, his music perfectly mirrors his, his person the intellectual rigour, the not unafraid to be difficult, the extraordinary and very human passion that I believe shines through his music. So it's been a great honour to help Joseph with this and to perform it for you tonight. And now I'd like to hand over to Sean Strew. Thank you. I first knew Joe at a distance by reputation. Um, and I got to know him a little bit better, uh, a step removed in the mid 80s when he was treating my partner, Michael Misso. Michael was nervous and very worried about his health. But on the days he had appointments with Joe, he returned home in an improved mood, calmer, and more at peace, even when Joe had to deliver bad news to him. When Michael was hospitalized with cryptococcal meningitis, I met Joe personally and experienced the unending depth of his compassion a few days later when Michael died and my world shattered. I had tested positive for HIV by then but only had minor symptoms. But I was amongst a group, a pretty large group of people in New York who knew of Joe and um, but didn't feel they were sick enough to take his time. You know, he was reserved for the people who were who were much sicker. Um, but I knew one day I would, would see him, and I did. Joe's patients were passionate about him and protective of him. In his waiting room, we would triage the appointments based on who was sickest, rather than whatever time the appointment was made for. We cooked and cleaned for him, we redecorated his office, we volunteered with his bookkeeping and his filing. We knew that he had unlimited time for any of us. I don't think Joe ever rushed a patient in his entire career. He always tried to deliver the worst news in person, frequently with house calls. Uh, Mathilde Krim mentioned one time that, that he, he was the only doctor she knew who attended every funeral of any of his patients who died. And a person with AIDS at that time who had run out of options, who had nowhere else to go, could always find hope and their best shot at survival in Joe's office. Joe told me once he never had a patient in what was called salvage therapy, except when he inherited such a patient from another doctor. Salvage therapy meant they had developed resistance to the available medications. Their clinician didn't know what else to do. The patient had run out of options, and Joe's practice was, was their next stop. Joe never explained an unknown symptom as well. You've got AIDS. These things are going to happen. He continued to diagnose, methodically testing each possible cause and treatment. Uh, no one could ever quantify the number of lives he saved both in his practice and in his research and his advocacy work. Uh, even as Joe donated significant archives to several different institutions in the U.S. and in the U.K., he kept in his home two large plastic storage bins, these great big bins, that were filled with hundreds of cards and letters, uh, some from patients, but mostly from surviving partners and parents and siblings of patients of his who had died writing from Minneapolis or Cedar Rapids or Peoria, thanking Joe for the care and love they showed to their loved one. I spent hours with Joe reading them and hearing Joe tell me more about every patient, every single one he remembered and he described. And, uh, Joe never gave up on any of us. Uh, and those of us who loved him and are still here today because of him uh, will never give up making sure his remarkable life achievements and deep humanity are not overlooked by history or distorted or maligned 
by those threatened by the powerful truths he told. When we think of AIDS activism in the 1980s, what comes to mind for many people are the theatrical demonstrations of ACT UP, the street protests, the, um, and those were important and I participated in them. But what transpired before ACT UP, ACT UP didn't really start until 1987, was in some ways even more powerful and was very much shaped by Joe and set the stage for ACT UP and all sorts of things. Uh, before ACT UP, uh, you know, in the 1970s, Joe wrote a memo to the New York City Department of Health describing a crisis in gay men's health and the need to create a focused effort on it. That was the 1970s. When he first started seeing patients with this immune suppression and he knew something terrible was going on, he reached out to a colleague from his interferon work, Dr. Mathilde Prim, to ask her to help raise $10,000 so he could conduct research and buy a freezer to hold blood samples. Uh, that turned into AMFA. Uh, the first civil liberties litigation around an h blood issue was when uh, his landlord tried to kick him out of his office in New York, and he fought that with Lambda. The first um, privacy protections for people with HIV, when no one was even thinking about that, Joe was saying this was important, and worked uh, to get New York State to pass such uh, protections. With his patients, he was very much an advocate for you need to speak for yourselves, you need to do this yourself, you cannot rely on any institution or even the gay community leadership uh, to save you. Uh, his introducing Richard Berkowitz and Michael Callan created a partnership and collaboration that changed history. Uh, the People with AIDS Coalition, the writing of the Denver Principles, a manifesto that in 1983 written by a group of people with AIDS that was later referenced in the 1986 uh, uh, Ottawa Declaration on Health, I think it was from the WHO, uh, and many documents since then really has had a huge effect on creating patient-driven uh, involvement in healthcare. Uh, Safe for sex, how to have sex in an epidemic, uh, the brochure that introduced the concept of how to stop transmission of this pathogen, have all the sex you want, just take the steps to, to stop that transmission the first AIDS-related professional journal, uh, the PWA Health Group, the, um, uh, the Buyers Club, uh, Community Research Initiative on AIDS, the whole concept of community-based clinical research at a time when the people who had the disease and the doctors treating us knew more about this than anybody else, more about it than those in, in research labs or drug companies or the government. And Joe devised a system of how to collect data from them rather than, uh, and which greatly expedited the process. His work on his multifactorial hypothesis, uh, cytomegavirus interferon, his advocacy of Bactrim, which was then the number one killer of people with AIDS. Uh, and he knew from research in the 1970s that it was used with immune compromised transplant patients to avoid, uh, prevent uh, uh, pneumocystis, which was what was killing people. Uh, and he couldn't get the gay doctors group in New York to promote this. Uh, Michael Cowan and others couldn't get Tony Fauci to uh, uh, issue guidance on this. From the day, between the day when Michael Callan and a group met with Fauci in Washington, begging with him to issue this guidance in 1987 to two years later, when that guidance was finally issued, uh, about, uh, I think it was about 17,000 people, mostly gay men, suffocated from PCP. All these things were before ACT UP, uh, and they all go directly back to, uh, to Joe. Um, but, you know, ultimately, and I think that the reason so many of us sort of feel so strongly about Joe, uh, his patience is, um, is really reflected in the message he had for Richard and, uh, and Michael after they drafted How to Have Sex in an Epidemic which was very clinical, it was really like, it was like science, it was like how to avoid transmission. And Joe came back and said he never talked about love. Uh, and they ended up going back and revising and adding this in here. Uh, and so the last sentence I believe in, in that piece is, if you love the person you're fucking with, even for one night, you'll not want to make them sick. Maybe affection is our best protection. And Joe, in every aspect of his life, meeting patients, it, it, he just sort of personified love and humility. Um, he told me one time that when he was 17 years old, 
uh, he took what he, he called it an, a childish uh, sort of idealism or an adolescent idealism, uh, a vow never to speak of himself, right? This was to cultivate humility and modesty in himself, which he says he, he uh, 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 broke quickly. But, but that is an insight into how he valued that in himself. Joe was not a person who ever sought the spotlight, who ever, you know, got in front of the microphone or the camera. Um, and um, uh, in some ways, I, I think his legacy has been punished for that. But uh, in time, uh, I think that's, that's, that's changing. Uh, Greg Gonzalez wrote a really interesting piece about how Joe's early work on multifactorialism has influenced the response to COVID in very important ways. So uh, I'm grateful to be here today, uh, literally here and here in a broader sense, and um, uh, uh, coming to London without having Joe here is a, is a, is a uh, sort of startling experience for me, but uh, thank you.
of, of Joseph's. Um, but I have the immense privilege of uh, working with him on a few of his organ works um, just before the pandemic struck, actually. At the time, I was also working with Morgan on one of his uh, commissions that I was very fortunate to premiere in the world, having the music. Um, Joe came along uh, one evening with a whole bunch of scores to me to play, uh, for me to play of uh, immensely complex, emotional, beautiful music, uh, much like the music that you're hearing this evening, and also the piece that I'm about to play and will also play later, his epilogue as well. Um, and again, I think others will speak much better than me about him the man, but I think uh, his music certainly personifies many of the characteristics that uh, a lot of people have told me about him, immensely emotional, caring, beautiful, thoughtful, and, and very deep, and so I have been enjoying.
first of all, I, I'd like to introduce myself briefly. My name is Simon Watney. I was a friend and colleague of Joe's. Well, I'll say something about that in a minute. But I just wanted to thank, to begin with, all of you for coming this evening to remember Joe. And I wanted to thank all the musicians in particular for the extraordinary effort they put together in preparing this concert. Um, Joe's life force lives on particularly keenly in his music, as we've heard. Um, deep feeling, passion, and humour too. Um, and I think that life force is already with us and will continue to be with us in the music we're going to hear tonight. Um, I'm going to be an interruption to that music for a little while, I'm afraid, and I fear I may be repeating some of the things that Sean has so eloquently described already. Um, I'm mindful of the fact, because I'm an art historian and my subject is church monuments, that it was almost exactly this time in the evening, on the 14th of October in 1944, that two incendiary bombs descended through the roof above our heads and burnt out the interior of this venerable building, one of Wren's great churches from the 1640s, a Dutch-style church. The photographs taken by the English artist John Piper, whose work I'm sure many of you know, a few days later, which are in the Tate Gallery archives. You can see them online of what this church was like a few days later. But it was, of course, rebuilt like London. I'm going to come on to the relevance of the war here, and it does have some immediate relevance. The church was rebuilt, it was restored magnificently, and opened its doors again in 1954. Many of us here today will be familiar with this church. Um, it has had a very honorable, track record over the last 50 years of standing up for any number of different causes, sometimes very unfashionable causes, um, including um, the as yet to happen acceptance of lesbians and gay men by the Church of England. Um, it was also a church which played a brave and important role in the worsening, darkening years of the AIDS crisis. I've and many of you, I'm sure, will, be, will have attended funerals here, memorials which became increasingly frequent in the course of the 80s and the early 90s. Um, and this church played a very particular role there. But that's not, I think, however important that was, an explanation for why we are here tonight, um, remembering the South African-born Dr. Joseph Sonnabend, who spent most of his working career, of course, in the United States. Um, so I'd like to, for a moment, just think about Joe and his sister Yolanda, born in the first half of the 1930s in Zimbabwe, in what was southern Rhodesia, where their parents had fled um, from the terrible centrifugal forces of violence and dread and terror, which had swept so many Jews and Jewish families away from their homes um, and where they'd grown up into all around the world. Joe's and Yolanda's mother was a doctor in general practice in Bulawayo, where the family had ended up. Um, she was at the same time an enthusiastic advocate and teacher of birth control in Bulawayo, whilst her husband worked in the sociology department of a university, uh, which I'll probably mispronounce, Witwatersrand in South Africa having been a distinguished academic sociologist previously at the University of Padua, where indeed he and his wife had met. Following the death of Joe's mother, when he and Yolanda were still school children, their care and upbringing wrote, fell largely on her sister Rachel, who was also a medical doctor who lived with the son events in Bulawayo, and with whom Joe and Yolanda remained in close contact until the end of her life her long life, I should add. During the closing years of the war, their father was occupied in the onerous task of re-educating the large numbers of Italian military prisoners of war who'd been transported to POW camps in South Africa. Here he established a pioneering and subsequently influential combined program of anti-fascist re-education and craft skills for life, ironmongery, ceramics, cookery, 
things that these young soldiers could take back into their newly invented lives, into the shattered world of post-war Italy. As a fluent Italian speaker, Joe's father was also involved on the ground level at the end of the war, setting up a new, free, democratic press in Mantua, um, and writing back to his work, to his wife, in southern Rhodesia. And I mention this for a purpose, because I can remember very clearly a particular afternoon during the final weeks in 2014, when Joe and myself were trying to sort out the enormous mountains of accumulated papers and possessions um, at number 30 Hamilton Terrace, a large early Victorian house in Maida Vale, which Joe and Yolanda's father had bought for them after the war. This was very fortunate, since on his death, almost, I don't need to go into that anyway, cutting a long story short, I spent several months with Joe trying to organise his scientific papers into some kind of order prior to their being deposited in the archives of the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine of the University of London, here in London. And that particular afternoon, I was in a box room, tall box room, stacked high with shelves, bulging with middle of files, papers, boxes of old cassettes, LP records from the 1950s. Um, I can't begin to tell you how much muddle there was. But out of that muddle, Joe plucked a letter from his father to his mother, written at the end of the war, in 1945. Um, and it was a letter Joe referred to many times subsequently into my memory. <coughs> in the letter, his father talked about, in wonderful tones, about the victory of the Allies over the Germans, over fascism, against the Nazis, the great opportunity this gave Europe for rebuilding a new, free, democratic Europe. It was a wonderful, visionary letter filled with joy and with triumph out of all the plucking success out of the jaws of the horrors of the war. Joe was deeply moved by this letter, by this message, as it were, from his father. And I'm mindful of the fact that in retrospect, however different Joe may have seemed to be from his parents, I think he inherited a lot from both of them. From his father, he inherited a capacity for public education, for reaching out to people who could be very different to himself and trying to persuade them of the, new, of the, of the importance of, of recognizing diversity at any rate, just as he followed in his mother's footsteps in the field of sex education. Um, to a very remarkable degree. Anyway, Joe came to England in 1957, and he himself was the living embodiment, I think, of a certain kind of post-war optimism. The National Health Service itself, in 1945, in the background, the trials of the former Nazi doctors in Nuremberg, and then the establishment, as he was growing up, of the Declaration of the Geneva Conventions of 1948, regulating all aspects of clinical research and medical ethics. These were to be key issues in Joe's involvement with the epidemic. Indeed, he gained an award for his vital work in setting down questions of confidentiality and patient rights and entitlements from the very beginning of the epidemic. All those different treatises culminating in the Helsinki Declaration of 1964 concerning research onto the human subject. Joe was passionately involved with that history. He knew that he was part of that history and that his colleagues in the National Health Service were part of that history. After studying medicine then in South Africa, he came to England, where after a brief period working in general practice, he became a house doctor at the Royal Free in Hampstead. Um, he told me, and I'm writing down here from an old memory, how he, he could remember from the early 50s how a particular consultant would arrive in his enormous and enormously grand Austin Princess car. I don't know whether any of you have any image in your minds of an Austin Princess car. They're fantastically grand. Her Majesty the Queen was often seen in an Austin Princess. Anyway, the doctor would arrive at the Royal Free for his meeting. He would sit outside in the car till precisely 2 p.m. when somebody would come out of the hospital, open the door for him, and he would enter into the hospital and come into the young doctor's sitting room before a ward round. 
and all the patients would be lined up for him to see, and the sister would hold out for him a crisply starched uh, robe. Um, and his manner was uh, something which Joe didn't care for at all. He thought the doctor was terrifically patronising. He addressed all the patients as sir or madam, which may sound respectful, but in fact it was quite the reverse. It was this snooty model of medicine, I think, which Joe very much reacted against and which founded, formed the basis for his own very personal treatment, uh, approach to treatment. He moved on to Edinburgh. He turned his attention to the study of infectious diseases and the then unfashionable field of microbiology, which soon brought him south again to the Medical Research Council, to Mill Hill, to the team which had discovered interferon, um, and he found himself right in the foreground of global research into uh, the treatment of diseases of people whose immunological systems were, for whatever reason, suppressed. In particular, a few years later, um, transplant patients. So Joe was familiar, completely by chance, before he ever went to America, with exactly the field of immune, immune suppression, which would prove to be so important in the wake of the advent of HIV. Here was this man, an expert in such specialized microbiology and virology, who was also a frontline doctor in the field of sexual health in Manhattan. This isn't the time again for me to try and summarize the whole of Joe's enormous career. Two of his patients, Sean and Ivy, are here to speak of Joe as a good doctor, as the good doctor, as he was often described. But I do think it's worth reiterating in London Joe was constantly setting up organizations. He was brilliantly good at getting people together. He was quite a shy man. He didn't like public speaking. He didn't like writing. Um, and he liked to work with people himself, uh, to work with his patients and with his colleagues, including myself. Um, he was the founder of the AIDS Medical Foundation, which morphed into Amphar. He was the co-founder, he was the founder and editor of the very first scientific journal on AIDS. He consistently tried to share his knowledge with his patients and with other people. And he inspired, as Sean described, at least two generations of different kinds of activists from the very beginning of the epidemic, the darkest, hardest years in some ways, through to the ACT UP generation, whom he educated as if they were coming around to, to college classes um, and whom he helped and encouraged enormously. That was the environment in which he conceived of the Community Research Initiative for undertaking fast clinical trials at the level of primary care. We didn't need activism in this country in the same way as in America. We had the National Health Service. But that in itself, I think, needs to be understood in a rather different way. I can remember a friend of mine who was diagnosed, American friend, who was diagnosed with PCP on holiday here and taken in St. Mary's. A few years later, he developed an illness, of something that affected many the eyes of many people with HIV. Uh, but he couldn't get the medicine that was available at St. Mary's for patients like himself in the same plight back in America. It wasn't available due to the complexities of licensing and other interruptions to availability. And this friend of mine, Charlie Barber, some of you may remember, used to travel the Atlantic to get his prescriptions here in London. That infuriated Joe. Um, it was an absurd cruelty. And it was Joe, we should remember, who dreamt up the brilliant idea, since he was licensed in both countries, of writing prescriptions in London for drugs which could be treated, which were clinically trialed and approved. I'm not talking about experimental drugs. And shipped back to the people with a PWA Health Group in New York. Um, I think that side of Joe's work is important to remember. It was an extremely pioneering um, and important innovation um, and, and initiative with which I and several other people were involved at this end of the process. Um, his work was equally important, of course, as Sean has mentioned, in the field of prevention. And I want to just mention, again, that we've seen already the cover of How to Have Sex in an Epidemic self-published by Joe, written with two of his patients, one of whom is still alive, Richard Berkowitz, the only person I know who's still alive who was part of the group which wrote the Denver Principles in 1983, which came up with the idea of people living with AIDS as a, as a notion. 
How to have sex with an, in an epidemic was absolutely epochal. At a time when everybody was simply saying, you have to stop having sex, which of course you can say, but it can't, how can you stop the human instinct for love and desire? You can't switch that off as if it was simply a tap. Joe said no, so there's another way. We can reduce risk. I needn't go into it all in great detail, but when I read that pamphlet, I was astonished. It seems to be a rational, reasonable possibility for forming prevention work. And I brought the copy back to London. Tony Whitehead already had a copy here in London, actually. And it formed the basis for all the work in the beginning of the Terence Higgins Trust when I chaired the Gay Men's Health Group there. And we started developing all the, the leaflets and subsequent videos and so on and so forth, which went through the 1980s, and which did indeed save lives. I can't begin to underline how important that publication was. It was the basis for safer sex work, not just in London, but in every country in Europe and around the world, in Melbourne, Australia, as much as in Canada. Uh, it was an extraordinary achievement, and Joe's work in the field of prevention there, I think, needs to be very importantly remembered in the context of his achievements. Um, London was his home, however. He always regarded England as his basis, as his home. He came back here as often as he could. He shared his house with his sister Yolanda and a succession of Burmese cats. Casper, some of you remember. Um, who was the other cat? Valdemar. There was another cat beginning with A. Agostino. <laughs> Over the years. Quilly is still alive and lives with me to this day in Deal. Um, and Joe loved cats, as did Yolanda. I won't try and say more. Joe wasn't a religious man. He would have been furious, and he was ex deeply upset by Brexit, uh, for the reasons that I've already touched on. His, his father's letter, his sense of Britain as being part of a, a European Union, a community of nations which transcended national identities. The whole of Joe's life was dedicated to that sort of that vision of the world, to diversity, to the richness of all of us and our lives. Um, and like many other people, he, he was very terribly sad by the whole Brexit fiasco. And he wasn't, however, a religious man. Joe's father, in between his being at school and going to university, he was sent to Rome, some of you may know, to a Jesuit school for about six or nine months. Um, and it was at that school where he learned Latin and he was taught scientific method as well, after school, by the Jesuits. He also ended up with a copy of this little book, which he always had on his desk, never far from him, The Cloud of Unknowing, um, an anonymous English 14th century treatise written by probably a Carthusian monk, a contemporary of Julian of Norwich. And I just wanted to pick up a sentence from it because it suggests something important, I think, about Joe, about, uh, like his music, um, an inner life unperturbed by the worldly dramas of egotism and jealousy or pride um, this is what the author of The Cloud of Unknowing advises us, and which I think Joe took very much to heart. I'm going to translate slightly into modern English at the beginning. If you're looking to... Let, do not therefore work till you get exhausted. At the first time you're looking for the truth, thou findest but a darkness, and as it were a cloud of unknowing, Thou knowest not what, savest that thou feelest in thy will a naked intent unto God. This darkness and this cloud is, however thou dost, betwixt thee and thy God, and letteth thee that thou mayest neither see him clearly by light of understanding in thy reason, nor feel him in sweetness of love in thine affection. And therefore, shape thee to bide in this darkness as long as thou mayest, evermore crying after him that thou lovest. For if ever thou shalt feel him or see him as it may be here, it behoveth always to be in this cloud 
of darkness. And if thou wilt busily travail and work as I bid thee, I trust in his mercy that thou shalt come there too. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Joe's great friend, Rebecca Pringle. Hi, I'm Rebecca Pringle Smith. Uh, uh, I consider Joe a great mentor, friend, and colleague. He had an uh, inestimable effect on my life, career, and approach to science. And uh, I know that the, some of the happiest decades of Joseph's life were here in London, and I want to thank Charles Mutter, Morgan Hayes, Joshua Ryan, and the other musicians for performing because it was an incredibly important part of his life and made him very happy. Um, I want to just make two quick points about Joseph, and one of them is about him as a very mainstream scientist. Joseph uh, was appalled at the idea that he was considered sort of radical. Um, many of his ideas were completely mainstream. Um, I also want to start with a bit of humor because one of the things about Joseph, he had a tremendous sense of humor. Uh, we had a, a ton of fun. Um, I brought his favorite candle. In our later lives, Joseph and I loved candles and scents. And our favorite that we ever found was called Abd el Qadr. And we used to laugh constantly at the liner notes. If you can imagine that a candle would have liner notes. I'm going to read them to you. A gust of freedom blowing from the mascara coast and the mountains picks up on the way the green scents of fresh mint, the rashness of fights, Ginger's hot and peppered aura, and the perfume of tea and tobacco from the Ulad Nail tribe. <laughs> so occasionally when I was having a glass of wine with Joseph, I'd say, do I detect the green scents of fresh mint? And I've always grown mint, and I always think of Joseph when I see it. When he and I went to Bulawayo in South Africa, we sort of ran around herb gardens, crushing herbs together and just going, mmm, mmm. And that's a part of Joe that, that many people might not know. Now, many people knew of his uh, sense of humor, and just one quick anecdote about that. When Joseph and I were at the Sixth International Conference on AIDS, uh, quite morose, <laughs> um, a, a well-heeled professor came up to both of us and said, oh, where are you staying? I'm at the Westin. I was staying at some diva hotel in the Tenderloin District, which by my standards was great. And Joseph looked at me and looked at the fellow and said, well, AIDS has been good to you. <laughs> and uh, they both laughed. And then as that fellow left, Joe said to me, you know, in the, Denzer, in the Denver principles, they came up to, with, uh, you know, not, not calling themselves AIDS victims, but people with AIDS. Then it became people living with AIDS. But you know, Rebecca, there's another category, people living off AIDS. <laughs> and I said, yes, Joseph. That would be us. <laughs> so um, I guess a, a couple of uh, relevant comments. Um, Joseph did study medicine at the Waters Rond University, which is among the top medical institutions in the United States. He did become an infectious diseases specialist, as Simon so eloquently put it, and as Sean mentioned, um, at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. Um, but at the time that Joseph became a researcher, immunology and virology were nascent and very exciting. And Joseph studied and became a scientist at the crown jewel of the Medical Research Council at Mill Hill, the National Institute for Medical Research. He, was, uh, he worked alongside the Nobel Prize winner, Peter Medawar, who was then director of that institute and who won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for discovering acquired immune deficiency. The groundwork was laid by Professor Sir Peter, Sir Peter Medawar's work uh, for the development of organ transplantation. 
So, and, and, and the substance interferon, you know, that, that is often talked about with Joe, it's, it's a substance that our cells make when we have a viral infection. And Joe was at the cutting edge of characterizing how this stuff worked to stop viruses from furthering their infection. He showed and published in the journal Nature that, in fact, part of the way interferon works is telling the cells which proteins to make to get rid of the viruses. Now, this was a very serious, very mainstream discovery. Similarly, the notion that the multifactorial model was somehow radical was appalling to Joseph. The idea that the consequences of any infectious disease can be diverse depending on other factors. And as everyone in this room knows, our current pandemic, COVID, the SARS coronavirus 2 infection can have an incredible array of results ranging from mild infection to the formation of blood clots to catastrophic respiratory failure and death. And none of us know in whom any of these effects are going to occur, although we do know something about risk factors. So the notion this is somehow radical is, is absolutely bizarre. But uh, uh, I've always tried to figure out why it is that Joseph was labeled this way, why he was so misunderstood. And I'm very grateful to Sean Strube for doing such great work characterizing and cataloging so much of Joseph's work in life. I think a lot of it may have been homophobia. Although Joseph didn't, it's so odd. He identified publicly as a gay man. And when I asked him about this, as he'd been married and had passionate relationships with women, he said, look, that's part of who I am. I love sex with men but I don't really identify between you and me as anything at all. But I'm certainly not gonna disown this aspect of my life, which many people are afraid to own. And I, I just think it's worth, uh, worth acknowledging that I think Joe was willing to take the consequences of homophobia, fought them, and a lot of what happened with his career was probably a result. Now, it's, oh God, it's almost exactly 41 years since the June 5th issue of the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report when AIDS was first, uh, first publicly discussed. Joe became aware in the 70s of this odd immune deficiency that was beginning to characterize many of his patients when he worked as a physician in Greenwich Village. And as you know, as a trained specialist in infectious disease, as well as as a virologist, immunologist, unfortunately, Joe was uniquely positioned to be a first responder in the catastrophe of AIDS in New York City. And uh, his work with Michael Callan, an AIDS activist, he, he educated and helped many of us develop. If it weren't for Joseph's tutelage and his giving me a vocabulary and a way to think, I wouldn't have been able to become a conduit for ACT UP between the statistical leadership of the National Institutes of Health in the US and the AIDS activists. It's, it's a direct consequence of Joseph. And uh, the very best scientists, they, they could never understand who Joseph was from, from my description of him. Uh, the person who wrote the obituary for the New York Times for him, Kit Seeley, a wonderful reporter, just couldn't kind of get her mind wrapped around all these different aspects of Joseph. But uh, all of my favorite scientist friends, when they met Joe, they instantly recognized him as, as someone extremely serious. Now, I guess in, in closing, I want to say that many AIDS activists and many AIDS institutions claim to have saved millions of lives. And uh, that sort of hyperbolic talk is, is appropriate for many of us who are activists, I think. But when it comes to actual science, actual epidemiology, Joseph is among very few whose work directly led to saving in the US on the order of tens of thousands of lives and possibly hundreds of thousands or millions more around the globe. Walter Hughes was actually a physician and scientist who first pioneered the use of prophylaxis for the infection that kills most people with AIDS then and now in the US. And its, its effectiveness was well known, and it became clear to Joseph that, in fact, the rate of pneumocystis uh, in people with AIDS was about four times what it was in organ transplantation. But it really wasn't until 1989 that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, 
really agreed that uh, prophylaxis was a good idea rather than adapting the science that was pretty well characterized from the 70s. And during that time, between uh, the time that uh, AIDS was first reported and the time when prophylaxis was recommended, over 30,000 lives were lost. I think this is really uh, one of the great sadnesses of Joseph's life, uh, that he wasn't able to be understood as a mainstream scientific figure. And uh, I'm so glad that in his later years in London, he was able to find a measure of peace and, and happiness. My thanks to all of you. And if any of you want to smell the candle that was our favorite, I had planned to put it by a sign-in book, but as this is a concert, um, I can't do that. <laughs> but I have it with me, if, if any of you are curious. Thank you.
I don't know what to do with myself. Like the music is just like so beyond my capacity. <laughs> um, let me start by um, using the languages how I grew up. Um, mi nombre es Ivy Kwan, y soy una persona que tuvo SIDA en 1990. Y el doctor Sonovan fue mi doctor durante esa época. Mohamed, Haikwan, Oewai. Y acá, Kao Sabrina, Moya Ojipe, Dr. Sonovan, Ichin Haimoa Isan. I'm incredibly grateful to be here, surrounded by those Joe Trust. And um, I'm recently transitioning from um, calling him Joe. <laughs> For 32 years, I, he was still my doctor. Um, I grew up in Bolivia and we didn't have health care, so doctors were always authority and like the principal, so I've never really shed that. So when people call him Joe, I'm still like, oh, okay. Um, Here in this room, I see like people like David, like Sean, and um, and and Rebecca, who I've never met. Who the reason I'm here is because of the work they did together. Um, in 1990, I was one of the few positive women, and um, as first generation immigrant, I didn't even know how to find a doctor, and there were no doctors for. They tested. They started testing women, but women had no connections of how to find an AIDS doctor. And as I was talking to Sean about it. At that time, we didn't really have AIDS doctors, right? These doctors became AIDS doctors. Um, um, so I went to ACT UP and um, I saw Michael Callan and I said, I want that relationship. I want to have a doctor where I could be that patient and, and talk to a human. But I was very intimidated by him. Um, and I'm also that one patient that were, it wasn't a gay man and it was a straight woman and it wasn't the color. When people were talking about people color, they weren't really um, wanting the color that wasn't <laughs> the one that fit the profile. So Joe and I spoke a lot about how I grew up in Bolivia because you know I had exposure for TB and how that was going to be um, a factor in my health. Um, I also like it was with Sean. I saved Joe as as I would come to him only when I was very sick because I wanted reserved his research um, workload to save our lives. Um, I recently reconnected with him and actually in, when he moved to, to London, um, when one of the, the director of the PW Health Group, Sally, died. Because I was forever perplexed how they were able to organize that way. And Joe would sometimes get mad at me because things that I thought was so complicated and needed so much network, he found it very easy. And it was a, I don't know why that's so, so complicated for you. So, um, while many of us can barely call ourselves soldiers in this, in this fight against AIDS, I would say that Joe wasn't a soldier. I would think he, he was obviously, he was a leader. Um, and I do circle back into how his DNA um, of changing the outcome of HIV is tied up to benefiting Ebola and now COVID, uh, the vaccines, and how Shauna talked about the concepts of, of even privacy and the rights of patient. 
30 years later seems like such a seamless thing, but that those things were fought really hard. I mean, when I tested positive in 1990, I was fired from advertising in New York City just because the perception that I would have HIV as a, a woman and what their relationship is when it's outside the gay community and the way people could not accept the danger of a woman menstruating and how impactful that was and how people were so afraid at the time. And I remember talking to Joe about this and he would say to me, well, the only thing you could do is fight really hard and, and be part of changing that stupid perception that it doesn't affect humans. And that's kind of a marching order, I think, for how the health group started. And I deeply, deeply love that at the end of his life, he kept on telling me of all the things he did, besides music, um, is that the health group was so important to him. Um, and I find immensely pride in, in just having, you know, what I consider authority to build something and call it the people with AIDS or people living with AIDS and taking us through that journey of responsibility in the fight and not being people that had no resources, that we became the resource. This year I'm actually in the Whitney Biennial with a collaboration with uh, Julie Tolentino and part of the many works that I have there is dedicated to Joe and Sally, who was the director of the PWA. Partly because a lot of us came back in 2010 and 12, um, reluctantly to work on prevention again for the young people that were getting infected again and worked on PrEP. And the notion that young people don't understand what is to stay adherent to medication because they don't have to be in clinical trials that we did when we were very sick. Or when Joe died, that ACT UP, whose membership is a lot of young people, did not know who he was. And that was extremely, extremely enraging to me. Um, also because he died in, in, in the second pandemic where they were benefiting from a lot of the structural work that this community has done, which is giving, that brought the solutions for COVID vaccines. Um, when people say things like, I won't take that vaccine because it didn't take 20 years to develop, it's, and it's because of the work that Joe did or Be Rebecca did. Um, despite of how scary it was those days, it was an incredible display of humans coming together. And Joe had ignited a lot of soldiers to do really, really good work. The health group importing and contrabanding medication that forced the NIH to, to study and become treatments for KS, for example, um, is stories that especially now during COVID, that we turned the page and we haven't really written about that history properly. And when I talked to Joe in 2020, he felt that his story wasn't told the way he had wanted. And in that, I feel like that is a message for a lot of people in this room, not only just to share what you know personally with Joe, and also very importantly, especially if you've done that work, to own that work, to own that history. And those who want to study your history, that they should be respectful and protect your ownership of that story. And I think that is something that was extremely painful for me speaking to him in 2020 about somebody that had done so much yet felt within community 
a level of betrayal, um, that within our community we're very messy um, in how we treat each other, um, and how that cannot remain as something that we accept, because that's part of the homework. Um, that's part of the homework, that's part of like why we have results like COVID vaccine and how um, globally we're gonna be only be able to move forward if we share that equality. So I'll tell a couple of stories that I think is important that probably we don't utter enough. And one person, for example, that helped us in the health group, she came with her brother, um, I will say uh, early 90s. Her brother was dying of, of, um, of AIDS and he had CMV. So the health group was able to give him the type of treatment to slow it down. And at the same time, the health group had decided that they needed to import thalidomide, which is a drug that is illegal in the United States that was used, um, I believe, in the 50s for anti-nausea for, for pregnant women and uh, cause defect in, in newborns. But yet, this group of the health group had profiled that this would help with KS, and they imported it from Brazil, and the sister, uh, Sheila, Sheila Oropo, who's a, an incredible artist, offered to, to bring the drug. And um, her, the parents, upon knowing that their son was just dying of, HIV, uh, of AIDS, going blind, um, they also found out that the daughter was also gay. And in that note, of the, the kind of death was so horrible and they were so homophobic, but yet within a short time, they were filling pills of thalidomide to be brought up to the US. And Shayla's story is hardly ever spoken, but this is Joe's DNA to ignite the power that we sometimes, well, mostly don't know that we have this kind of power. So, and that, that is a, an example that how many people live through that. And, and today, we're in the brink of Africa being able to manufacture injectable PrEP once a month for 30 million African women. And this is also the DNA of Joe and the people in this room. And we need to keep that very much in light in the noise of, of COVID. As well as there will be a vaccine next year manufactured by Africa by themselves because they cannot wait for Pfizer and all this red tape that we are so accustomed. And again, this is DNA of the people in this room and of Joe. It also taught me as a very member of a community that is very silenced, um, that doesn't speak up. I look at pictures there and I remember Morgan asking me if I had a picture with Joe and I did not, I was not out about being positive until Trump was elected really. Um, because I felt it was a duty at this point like, and I had nothing to lose. I had my, my oldest child who's 22, nine, 10 years after I was positive, because we had harnessed the power to change science and I went for it. I did not let institution tell me and, and be stuck in a 1984 where, where I would deny myself the access to science. And that again, um, is the DNA of Joe and the people in this room and people in New York as well. Um, but the medication that I fought with for not only kept me alive, but gave me the opportunity to make a choice to be a parent when globally I was, we were told not to. And in that, it provided data for globally for women to be able to have children safely and not transmit that virus. So I have also a second child who's 18. And this morning, ironically, he um, 
in his film class in New York, um, they were watching How to Survive a Plague. This is completely <laughs> related, and it just happened. And um, you know, it was really hard for for him at at age 18 to barely come back to school in January because he had tried to keep me safe during COVID. And at one point he started telling his friends, you know, I can't get my mother exposed if I go to school. And finally they said, well, what could it be? Could it be cancer? You know, it, you know, it's just old people. And finally my son said, you know, my mom has HIV and they were looking on their phone, was that HIV with a V or a B, you know? And this is what it's like when we don't tell a story. This is New York City in LaGuardia. Um, and then being them completely horrified what they saw because they, they're the generation that have not seen what HIV looks like or AIDS looks like. So th that is the marching order I feel like in my last conversation with Joe of understanding how we as a community also failed him in in honoring him and holding his story the way he wanted. Um, and I see David there, who has done a lot, who doesn't feel like his story matters, but I, it matters. And however that makes it in a page, in a recorded document, remains extremely important. It remains important to my children and as we honor the people of Africa to mobilize in a way that we can't mobilize in the US, it matters that that gap of history makes it and be documented. Um, so as a practice for me of being able to speak up as an Asian woman, straight woman, middle class woman is that Torner Joe, I wasn't sure if the number 1108.22, or is it 08.11.22, because the Europeans do it, but basically November, November 8, everybody in this room, whether you're American or not, please remind Americans to vote. Torner Joe, for the choices, that we give each other. And as Simon has spoken, and to honor his mother who so long ago fought for those choices and that we're in the brink of losing those choices. And the other marching order, I would say during this war with, in the Ukraine is that mobilized in terms of in the UK, of sending medications for HIV positive people through Simon Collins here, his organization, iBase. And the last order, which is basically how the core of my story and a plead for Joe story, is that document your life, protect it, don't let anybody profit from it. So that this work is not a turn page without anything in it. Thank you. I'm gratitude to, to everybody in this room and to Joe for, for my own survival of 32 years as a positive person. Thank you. Music was vital to him. He was self-taught as a composer after work in New York as an escape from the horrendous pressure he must have been under. He went home and composed. He had no intention or desire for this music to be heard. 
He finished a piece, put it in a drawer and forgot about it. He came back to London and fell in with some musicians and decided that actually he would like his music performed. So one of the musicians that he fell in with was Andrew Tooby, whose somewhat thankless task was to get some of this music in performable um, condition, apart from working on new music with him. And at some point, he, Andrew got others of us involved, and that would involve going around to Joe's, and Joe would say, well, what do you think about this one? And he'd get up a piece on Sibelius that he became very good with. Because he never envisaged the music being performed, he got less and less concerned about it being performable. So, for example, there were passages for piano music where you'd have things like this, nine notes in each chord. Now, the average pianist has five fingers. <laughs> so, you'd say, well, Joe, you can't do that. You'd say, obviously, you, of course you can't. It's, it's, an, it's impossible. It's unplayable. And you say, well, what do we do? Well, just cut out four notes or something. <laughs> Well, that still means you can't... You know, it. Well, what about... Just play the top note. <laughs> so, 94 notes would get reduced to about three, and it would sound fine. We didn't have time to go through all his compositions, there's hundreds of them, and whenever he would talk about it, he would say, well, I just guess that the pianist would just, you know, make their own version of it. You know, just leave out bits and, put, you know, change it around. So the interesting thought is that no two performances of a work of Joe's are going to be the same, because everyone's going to leave out different bits or rearrange it or edit it or whatever. So it's an interesting thought. There's loads of music out there, much of it uncatalogued, much of it still not um, performable, but hopefully one of these days, with enough Andrew Toobies and Morgans and people like that, some of it might get out there. So this is a little piece. Um, the other thing is we have no idea when pieces were written because he didn't put dates or anything like that. It's completely haphazard. He didn't put titles. So we have piece number 10. Oh, but he's already got piece number 10. So this piece number 10 is a slow one, and that's a fast one. This one's called April, and it's completely arbitrary.
New York, 1978. Dr. Joseph Son Abbott was working at his sexual health clinic in Greenwich Village in New York City, and he began to notice strange symptoms in his patients. Low white blood cell counts, rare forms of pneumonia, cancers, and organ enlargement. And soon, his patients developed symptoms that they couldn't recover from. That was the start of a journey that would put Joseph at the forefront of the AIDS epidemic. He worked ceaselessly amid the trauma to find out the scope of this terrifying condition in the 1980s and 1990s. And his compassion for his patients was, in part, inspired by music, his own piano playing, and his composition. Now, Joseph was born in what was then Rhodesia, and is now Zimbabwe, in 1933. Now 87 and living in London, he had his first major concert as a composer a couple of years ago, including this piece, Mirage. I spoke to Joseph Sonabend leading up to World AIDS Day on the 1st of December. Where was this love of music first sparked? I was taught the piano from an age I can't remember. It was that early in my life, so I do remember when I was a schoolboy, I resented having to practice, you know, <laughs> around the age. I wanted to go out and play with my mates, so I think that's a common experience. My mother was a physician. She was a busy doctor, but she liked music, and in those days, uh, the records you could get were old uh, 78 records. So that's what I was brought up with, and she had quite a collection. So I was at school in the 1930s. I was born in 1933. The war started in 1939. I grew up in southern, southern Rhodesia, a place called Bulawayo. It was the second largest city in the colony. And it was isolated. There was nothing around it except bush. But within the confines, it was a kind of hive of cultural activity, largely because of the refugees, mostly Jewish refugees from Czechoslovakia, Germany, Hungary, all those places. And they brought orchestras and wonderful cooking with them and this cultural treasure that came with the refugees. So it was part of life. It wasn't an escape from anything very much. Were you composing? Uh, uh, no, not really. I used to improvise when I was a kid. I remember that. You see, I'm fascinated listening to your music. There's performances from a couple of years ago, a very special concert in 2018. Um, Michael Finnessy is playing a piano piece of yours called Mirage. And right. you could say there are maybe influences of turn of the century harmony, maybe right. Schoenberg, maybe Lake Brown. I want to hear where it comes from in you, but it also doesn't sound quite like anyone else. Joseph. So it's uh, where, where that comes from. I said my mother had a collection of records and one of the recordings that I turned to a lot around about the age of 12 was a, a collection of the orchestral interviews from Wojciech. From Abba Berg's opera yeah. Wojciech? Yeah. yeah. They were favourites. I don't know what to say. We're a twelve-year-old boy whose mates were playing rugby and sort of climbing the walls, and which was, I did too, you know. But in that environment, in a tropical environment, I just absolutely turned on to that particular kind of music. So I think I developed a kind of taste for that sort of chromatic, somewhat discordant kind of over-the-top kind of expressionist. <laughs> In a sense, this has been a private part of your life or a yes, part of your life which has been yours and not shared until recently with the rest of the world. But when, when did you start to compose in earnest in your own Postbergian idiom? I think round about in the 1990s with the advent of notation software because before that I used to write things down on pieces of paper which would get lost and that motivated me to take it more seriously about preserving stuff, you know. I was a very busy doctor. Indeed, and you were pioneering and the world remains in your debt and will always be for the work that you did in New York during the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. In the context of everything you were seeing on a day-to-day -day yes. basis there as a doctor. Where was music in the midst of all of that trauma? During the years we're talking about the ASAP and I was really busy, I have no doubt that music constituted an important part of keeping me going, I would say so. But I didn't feel that at the time, maybe because I didn't give it much thought. You know, if I had 
maybe I might have recognized it. I just simply looked forward to the Sundays or time I had off. And sometimes I brought manuscript paper with me to the clinic. But I just did it. You know, I wasn't aware of it being a sustaining influence. It's the difference between something that has an effect and an awareness that that effect is you know, happening. And probably all the more important for precisely being that unconscious, if you like, activity, that whatever else it was, was something else. You know, manuscript, paper and your clinical work, two mm-hmm. different worlds. Although, of course, there were moments where all that came together. You were, you know, making music with your, with your patients. Oh, yes, I did. And many of my patients, or many, some were performers. For a long time, I had a, a relationship with one of my patients who was a sort of modest pianist. It was better than me. We had a regular meeting to go through forehand music, similar with one of the earlier patients with AIDS, a proper 1983, 84 young man, a very talented composer, quite horribly tragic, who died at the age of 26, I think. He was you know, incredibly talented, but he was also good with instruments, reconditioning pianos and things. And uh, he was quite nimble on the flute, so I had, for a long time, we we had this relationship with him. Then he got Kaposi sarcoma, if you recall the, those purple things that happened to people with AIDS. It affected his face, which is not a cancer in the sense that it doesn't metastasize or spread. And Bobby, his name was Bobby Bloom, he got it on his face, and his face became very swollen, and to the point where he could no longer play the flute. His lips became puffy, and he couldn't do it. But he could play the piccolo. One can only surmise that the ability and the opportunities to make music when you're in a time of such distress, you know, is very significant. Well, I think even for those who listen to music, you know, mm. you know in times of extremity as, as it was, I don't think one can minimize the significance of the effect of listening as well as making music. When you listen to your own music, Joseph, yeah. I think of Fluctuations, which is a, yeah. a beautiful, intense sort of violin piece that you're working on recording as well, and which we can all access on your YouTube channel. Does it speak to you of the, of the time that it was written? What does it represent to you? Uh, I have to say I'm pretty much detached from it. I do need other people to point out, and then I can see it, as it were. It's as if I'm actively keeping a distance from it. It's out there. I had not written anything for solo violin. I was frightened to do it because I'm not a violinist. But the idea of this solo piece for violin, I thought really needed to explore all the different things the violin can do. But a friend, Andrew Tuvey, as the composer, who kept insisting I should do it. And then eventually, kind of, I said, OK, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and that, um, was, that was this year? That was earlier yeah, this year? It was earlier this year, yes. So, okay. so it's recent, actually. It's recent. It's, for whatever reasons, I sort of accepted that I have a predilection for certain harmonies, chromaticisms. I just, I think all of us, you know, we have taste, so that's got to reflect something about ourselves, you know. So I think all of us have an individual sort of closeness or affinity to certain kinds of of music, and I do for sort of, you know, kind of rather tortured harmonies, and not just like the Berg, but, you know, late three of them. That stuck with me almost all my life, you know, I just kind of feel comfortable with that. And what are you listening to at the moment? I wonder, is it still Berg and Scriabin that's yes, so, getting you through well, the mode? The Met had a, a performance of Roderick just yes, Sunday, which I listened to. <laughs> it was uh, the William Kentridge production of oh, yes. Roderick. Berg is mercifully short. <laughs> 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 yeah. and, um, uh, and it's just wonderful music. And, uh, and there's also some, another aspect to music of this sort, is that uh, structurally it, it seems to be held together, if you like, mm. uh, by a reliance on sequence, which can then be transformed in so many different ways. I do think, you know, using a sequence in orders, permutations and things does produce a unity, some kind of cohesion. I, I actually do, I do that. It's in fluctuation, I call it fluctuation, because it begins with the 12 note sequence. And everything else then is kind of variations on that. But the variations of a repeated code, that's a, yes, a, a yeah. good description of so many pieces of music and also for the uh, coherent chaos of our own bodies from ourselves right. to its larger yeah, structures yeah, too. Yeah. Okay, maybe, well, maybe. But you know, well, musical works are, are in a way like, like human bodies actually, in a way, mm-hmm. perhaps. Yeah, well, uh, except that they tend to live longer than our bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> 
Joseph Sonavant. Hear more of his long-lasting music on his YouTube channel.